Good afternoon, and welcome to this discussion on the future of human exploration of space. This is the second in a series of three sessions uh, that the Marshall Institute and the Space Enterprise Council are putting together on this subject. Now, of course, space exploration has been a long theme uh, of the work that David Logsdon and I have done together, but this particular uh, set of three uh, sessions is focused specifically on how do we make and construct the, a robust space exploration program. Today's session, which is the second, uh, is focused on the discussion of manned exploitation of near space. Uh, several weeks ago we did a, a session that was focused more on the moon uh, and then sometime in May or early June we'll close out this set of three uh, by focusing specifically on the political, the budgetary uh, and the economic issues or legal rather, legal issues associated with growing uh, the program domestically. Uh, I'm pleased to have with us today a set of three experts to explore the subject of near space exploration. I'm going to introduce the first two of them and then my colleague David Logston will introduce the third. Our first speaker today is Martin Elvis. He's a senior astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, uh, where he's served since 1997. Prior to that, he worked with the Chandra X-ray Se Center, and the he was a science data system group leader at that particular institution. He has over 200 papers and refereed journals, over 70 articles, and is uh, amongst the highest percentile astronomist and space scientist cited uh, worldwide. Uh, we're pleased to have you here, Dr. Elvis. Our second speaker is Cheryl Reed. She is the program manager for the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory Space Department and is also the Civil Space Program Development Manager. Since joining the APL in 1985, she has held major program and project management roles for more than 20 national and international civilian and national security space systems. Her current project assignments include the NASA Robotic Lunar Lander, which recently received the NASA Silvers. NASA Silver Achievement Medal, the Marco Polar R Asteroid Sample Return Study, and she is the NASA Technical Consulting Team Lead for the B612 Foundation Commercial NEO Survey Mission. And to introduce our final speaker, my colleague David Logsdon from the Space Enterprise Council. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> it is my distinct honor to introduce Rosanna Statler, partner at Blankstein. Um, Blankstein, Posternak, Blankstein, and Lund, the premier law firm in Boston, Massachusetts. Rosanna is a three-time, I think it's three-time recipient, I love embarrassing you, uh, of a award uh, that is the uh, Massachusetts Super Lawyer Award. Three years? Five years? A number of years. A number of years. <laughs> so, works for a, the premier law firm in Boston, Massachusetts, and it has been recognized for a number of years as one of the premier lawyers in the state of Massachusetts. Also is a longtime friend and advocate for commercial space, one of the founding members of the uh, Space Enterprise Council, founded uh, back in 2000 at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, has been a loyal supporter, board member of the Space Enterprise Council, uh, now, uh, counting 14 years. Um, so it's my distinct honor to introduce to the crowd Rosanna Sattler. I'm going to talk about uh, a space economy as the way we will get space settlements. And I do indeed work at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Today I'm here on my own time because uh, you'll see why later. So this is purely to give me street creds. Okay. Uh, this is, talk is based on um, something I published in uh, this Harvard International Review and in Nature as an op-ed piece, and uh, it's been developed since then, so it's a, a year or so ago. Basic point, uh, where's my space settlement? I was a teenager growing up in England when this movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, came out, and I assumed that by now I would be living on one of these space stations, so I'm really feeling cheated. And, whoop. Uh, how do we make it so? How do we, what, what do we need to make that happen? I believe we need an exponentially growing space economy. Don't be afraid of exponential, that's just what economies do. They grow as a percentage of their previous size each year. So why do we need that? Because we want to enable a human presence throughout the solar system, for insurance purposes at least, uh, a safer, richer Earth, and science breakthroughs, which I as an astronomer am sure we will find by going deeper into space. So, oh, 
Space is a very small industry. We don't tend to think of it like that. But 300 billion or so a year in 2012, that's a generous estimate. Compare that with Walmart. So it's obviously not a very large fraction of the economy. That's the world space, uh, uh, space economy versus just Walmart. So it's interesting to ask, from $300 billion base, how fast could that economy grow? It's just an interesting exercise in, in compound interest, really. Uh, and it's an exponential, so it's very sensitive to the rate you choose. Here's some illustrative graph. If you grow at 2%, then in 25 years, you've only grown by less than a factor of 2. If you have 10% growth, you go by almost a factor of 11. So let's compare that with real life examples. The US economy, surprising to me, grew at 2% a year for like 100 years, even when it was becoming the greatest economy on Earth. California, from the gold rush to 1950, grew at 5% a year. And China, in the last generation, has grown at about 10% a year. So these are all plausible numbers for how fast the space could grow, depending on how lucky we are uh, and how uh, profitable it is. And if that adds up over a century, then of course it makes an enormous difference. As you can see on the right, a factor of seven to a factor of 13,000 if you choose the wrong, if you get the ro a lower uh, growth rate. So last year, in 2012, space grew at 7% or just about. So just it's in a good position. Now, the big problem, of course, as I think a lot of people here are aware, is that the cost of getting to space and doing things in space has not come down since the beginning of the space age. In 1969, Apollo 11 cost about $10,000 a pound to get to orbit. And 40 years later, the shuttle cost $10,000 a pound. So that's not what we call, if computers had gone the same way as we all say, uh, that wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't have cell phones in our pockets and smartphones in our pockets. The problem, I think, is that there's very little incentive for savings in the system, for cost savings. Um, so we need to find a new approach. And I think we all know uh, a good approach that is a, very, a good tool that's very effective for bringing down the cost of things. Uh, but, first, ah, but first, I should tell you why I care. Why should an astronomer care about these things? And that is because we are facing a problem. We are also victims of exponential cost growth in our missions. When I started in X-ray astronomy, uh, there was a little satellite called Uhuru that had just launched, and it was revolutionary. It gave us the, some of the first evidence for black holes and neutron stars. It was very compelling. Uh, that was so successful, it led to a, a, a much bigger observatory called the Einstein Observatory, which basically found that anything in the universe emits X-rays, so there are violent events going on almost everywhere. And that led to the, one of the great observatories, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and that has been uh, a, a astounding success, too. The problem is, of course, the cost growth, as you go from these three generations, has averaged 10% a year. And since the US economy, as I mentioned, is growing at 2% a year, these curves are on a collision course. And this is not just true of X-ray astronomy, it's true of all parts of astronomy and of planetary sciences. So those, these curves have got to cross. And this has been called by some other people the funding wall. Any exponential eventually come, becomes essentially vertical, and you can't go any further. There is a limit to how, much, how big the space program can be. So we won't be able to have a suite of great observatories in the next generation. We'll have one, the James Webb Space Telescope. And I find that disappointing. So what can we do about it? Oh, and that means that things like this, terrestrial planet finder, although we know technologically pretty much how to do it, so we could image continents and oceans on other Earths that we are now beginning to find, starting to find, it's, it's off, the, off the books. It, it's just not going to happen. We can't afford it, which is particularly disappointing. So as, again, a lot of people here know, it's not that space has to be expensive. So there's uh, the famous Elon Musk in front of one of his Falcon 9 uh, version 1 rockets. It costs $56 million to launch a Falcon 9. Of that, half a percent is the fuel cost. So there's a lot of room for savings. It's expensive for other reasons. What we need are incentives to bring that cost down. And I think, again, as an English teenager growing up in socialist Britain, very much at that time, uh, 60s, uh, I was astonished to see not only the beauty of the uh, space station and the shuttle that they used there, but the logos, Pan Am and Hilton and others. And I thought only Americans would do it the private enterprise way, except we don't. So my goal, my idea is, it's very obvious to people, my, uh, is that we should use capitalism to, as a tool to uh, settle space. 
Greed is the counterweight to caution. It gives us that incentive to restrain costs. Um, and the, so the profit motive provides an opposing pull to, to fear of making a mistake, of something not working. To do that, we need to have space ventures where government isn't the customer. There's a problem with monopsony, which I can get into if you like, and for whom the cost is a driver. If you're trying to make money out of space, you will really care about the costs, and you will argue over them, and you will bring them down. And because time is money, our primitive rockets that we use today can be uh, in enhanced using technology we know how to do in principle, but have not developed. And we'll be able to uh, have much more ambitious uh, space program and space settlements than we can imagine today. So, but the problem is, how do you get started, right? It's very easy to imagine huge solar power uh, satellites in space, uh, but you can't, how do we get them? We can't afford them right now. So let's look at some possibilities. People often say helium-3 from the surface of the moon. That's great if we had a helium-3 burning fusion reactor, but we don't have fusion reactors either. So that's not exactly the first thing you do, right? Uh, I mentioned space-based solar power, but the problem is raising thousands of tons of, of infrastructure to a geostationary orbit is absurdly expensive. There's no way you can afford it. So that's not going to be the first thing we do. Eventually, yes, but not at first. The moon you heard about a couple of weeks ago, if you were at that meeting, uh, a lot of people talk about mining water from the permanently dark craters, which you see in green on this map of the south of Pol south southern hemisphere of the moon. And that's quite interesting. Uh, there is a problem with water, and if you try and you can do this for lots of for several cases, but I've looked at um, one. The problem is that in space, no one can hear you sell. There are trillions of dollars of resources up there. Well, there's trillions of tons, but they're not worth a, a dime until you have a customer, right? And water is only valuable to sell at this kind of rates we're talking about in space. So who are you going to sell it to in space? Uh, well, a very plausible thing, and again, I think you heard from Bigelow a couple of weeks ago, uh, these uh, private research laboratories and uh, uh, perhaps even hotels. So if you, but let's put some numbers in, which I like to do because I'm a scientist, so I'm data driven. Uh, the launch cost for 10 per year for the water needed for 10 tourists or researchers in one of these things is about a billion dollars a year. Uh, so if you, the cost for making money out of that by providing it from space, assuming you want to make a big profit, because why are we in this unless we want to be obscenely rich, it's not enough of an incentive, uh, is that you've got to provide 55 metric tons of water for $300 million. And that's a lot of money, that's a lot of mass for not very much money on the scale we're talking. Now, uh, that's challenging. Uh, it may mean that uh, one thing that uh, NASA could do, for instance, is, is stimulate a market by providing a guaranteed uh, an initial uh, market for the water from space so that it can become established and then it would uh, generate more business later. It's much easier if you have people in geostationary orbit, by the way. The fa it's a factor of order 16 easier uh, to make a profit. So anyway, because the moon doesn't look that promising, because it's actually not very rich in uh, resources, uh, compared with the asteroids, I put my bets on the asteroids. This is a real map of the known asteroids as of some time ago, a couple of years ago, from the Minor Planet Center at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, you can see the orbits of the various planets. The, most of the asteroids are in the main belt, and they're the ones labeled green. That's between Mars and Jupiter. But the ones that are red, come close to the Earth. They're called the near-Earth asteroids. They're not always near, but their orbit crosses the Earth or gets very close to the Earth's orbit. And some of those are, much, are easier to get to than the surface of the Moon. So this is good news. And they're also particularly rich in materials. They're basically flying mountains in space, anything from a, a few uh, you know, football size to, to a small planet size. We're typically talking about things uh, uh, football stadium sized uh, for being interesting for resources. So they're rich in resources um, in water because some of these are very primitive bodies and water forms very, uh, a lot in the early solar system and they can be, could be as much as, could be as much as 20% water in some good cases. Uh, they're rich in precious metals like the platinum group metals. Those are rare on the Earth's surface and in the Moon's surface because most of the metals sank to the core 
when the Earth was molten. That also happened in uh, asteroids, the small planetismals that came first, but then those bashed together and exposed the cores of some of these. So some of these asteroids are almost pure uh, nickel iron and rich in these platinum group metals. And some of them, uh, about half of those are as rich as the platinum mines on Earth, and a quarter of them are five times richer in platinum group metal. So these are promising places to go. Uh, and those are, can be sold on Earth now for $25,000 a pound. So that's good. You don't have to bring much mass back, and mass is hard to move in space, of course, before you can imagine making a profit. There could also be, and this is a new idea that I'm writing a paper on with a student, uh, novel materials in space. Uh, there are a few dozen minerals that, formed only, that are found only in meteorites and so formed only in space and uh, perhaps because of the very long cooling times there, we can get into that. Uh, one of them is uh, tetrateonite, which has a very high magnetic coercivity, and you go, wow, well, what's that? And the answer is it, it's very resistant to having its magnetic field flipped when you put it in a strong magnetic field in a different direction. And that, could, for instance, would be, if, if we were still using hard drives, it could make 10 times smaller grains, so you could increase your storage capacity by a factor of 100. And the Japanese, a Japanese group is looking into making this material artificially. If they can't, it might be something worth mining in space. But we know very little about that. There are surprises that are possible, some would say likely. But for this, you need a lot of research. And that's the sort of thing the government does well. Asteroids are also dangerous, so the good news is fear and greed in this case, in the case of asteroids, point in the same direction. Now, this is, I got into trouble with one of the mining companies, asteroid mining companies, for writing a paper that tried to assess how many asteroids are actually worth mining. And the answer is they're, they're kind of rare, like beachfront property, they're going to be valuable. I asked how many ore bearing asteroids, ore bearing meaning profitable to mine, and I put this little equation together, uh, which new scientists called the Elvis equation, which I was very pleased with. It's uh, very similar to the Drake equation for finding out how many civilizations could contact us in our galaxy. But the answer is that roughly one in a thousand of all asteroids is actually worth enough to bring back uh, and could be, and is accessible, so low delta V for the, in the parlance of the uh, industry. That means for platinum, there's only of order a few dozen while for water, there's a few thousand total in the, in, the near Earth, in the population of asteroids that we can get to now. That's with today's technology. With better rockets, we'll be able to go rapidly to higher numbers because as you change the delta V, just by a small amount, you've got a very steep curve you go up in terms of numbers of, of asteroids. So this will go up a lot as ra rocketry improves. So if we can just get started with these, which are only worth a few tens of billions of dollars, reasonable starting point, then uh, we will qu quickly ramp up to an order of magnitude more of those. And so the first thing to do is to find them, so we know to go to them. That means finding tens of thousands more. We're currently finding about 1,000 near-Earth asteroids a year. NASA has wisely invested in improving that rate, and it will go to at least 2,000 a year starting this year, maybe 3,000. We aren't quite sure how well the PanStars telescope in Hawaii will be once it's dedicated to this. And of the ones we know, very few do we even know uh, what type of asteroid they are, and that means we can't, uh, uh, that we need astronomers, I'm pleased to say, who are interested in asteroid prospecting. So we need applied astronomers. So for the first time in 150 years, astronomers are going to be actually useful for something and not just understanding the entire universe, which we kind of, kind of pride ourselves on. So we have to answer the question, how big are they? And what are they made of in order to know if they're worth mining? This is basic prospecting 101. They could be solid nickel iron lumps. They could be piles of rocky rubble. They could be ancient agglomerations of water and organic materials and rock from the early solar system. And we don't. And it's very easy to tell. You just look at their spectra, and there's the three spectra of the different types. And it's quite obvious which one's which. No. Nope. But that 0.7 micron feature, which is a very tiny dip, that's, that's hydration, a hydration thing. So that means there's water in, in something like clay in the surface of this uh, object. So if you could even do this kind of thing, uh, categorization, you'd know a lot. It would, just by knowing this, you get the size much, much more accurately, and you get the density quite accurately, and, and you have some idea what you might be able to mine from it. 
This would be good. Um, that needs, prof this is, needs professional astronomers and large telescopes. We put the numbers in, we're about to publish this. Uh, you need large, like a, a two meter telescope is the minimum you're gonna use for this. Four meter is very useful, and even eight meter, which is about as big as they get nowadays, uh, would be extremely valuable for this. If you want to do it in bulk, right? This is all being done by scientists right now, astronomers, but they are not interested in surveying for, in prospecting purposes. They're doing for understanding the origin of the solar system, and for them, a few hundred is fine. For prospecting, we need tens of thousands. So two examples of how we could go ahead, and there's many others. I'm being quite unfair by picking out NEOCAM, which is a JPL possible mission. The B612 Foundation wants to fly their own uh, mission, which is a great idea. It's quite similar in many ways. Uh, I want to take over a telescope at Kitt Peak that's being otherwise mothballed uh, for a modest amount of money, and I can get thousands of those spec for a year. Uh, so let's hope. Now, uh, this being Washington, it's, uh, I like to say, so what, if we want to get a space economy, what, what can we do to further that as the United States? Right? So I like to use the example of the American West. This is a dangerous example because everybody has preconceived ideas about what the West was like. But I read a book about it. Uh, we tend to imagine the, the uh, settlers going off in their covered wagons boldly into nowhere, into unknown territory. And that they certainly were bold and brave, but they weren't completely foolhardy. They had, in fact, got maps to guide them. So, and that was because of a 60-year-long buying down the risk by the US government. This book on the right, Exploration Empire, by William Gutzman, uh, goes through one by one all the different exploration expeditions, mapping expeditions, resource determination expeditions, uh, sent out by the governments, uh, the state and federal governments of the US over 60 years. And it's an enormous catalog of work. And that's the kind of thing that we can imagine doing to buy down the risk for the real entrepreneurs who will go out and make a commercial space economy. Sorry, what's that 60 year period? Uh, from, from Lewis and Clark to the, um, to the uh, Golden Spike, for, roughly. Uh, the completion of the intercontinental, inter transcontinental railroad. So here are a few things that one could do by, as a matter of policy. You could help find the asteroids. You could help prospect them. You could demonstrate mining techniques. You could even seed the market to give a, a supply, like the a, a famous example is airmail, which was a guaranteed uh, a, a market from the government in the 20s, I think, for, to stimulate aviation. You've got a, you can legalize them, that is a lot of property issues, which I'm sure we'll be hearing about from Rosanna, and in the end, you'll have the chance to tax them. So a lot of things can be done that can help make a space economy real, and space mining in particular. And uh, I have this idea, which is why, of course, I'm here on vacation, on my own time, not as an uh, employee of the Smithsonian. I think we could change NASA's basic goal which is a rather muddled set of things right now, if you read some, I, there's a great report on this, to enable the commercial development of space resources as its number one priority, right? Don't worry about human versus robotic and that kind of thing, that's a false dichotomy, that's not an interesting thing to talk about, I don't think, because human exploration and settlement will follow if you have a space economy. And if we don't have a space economy, it's, it's all gonna be just playing around like we are now with a few people in space, just because we like to do it. I don't think there's real a choice. Uh, there'll be a couple of other minor missions like save the planet and explore the universe, but that's, uh, those are, I think they should be secondary. The great thing about this goal is it's specific enough to define programs that engineers can then execute, but it's not, uh, it's open-ended enough that it's not uh, self-terminating like Apollo. Let us go to this place. Okay, we're there, you're finished. Once we've gone to the near-Earth objects, the far greater wealth of the main belt will be accessible because we'll have better rockets by then because we're trying to make a profit and that means fast rockets. So you can imagine from 1804, this is the Lewis and Clark map. 1869, Golden Spike. So it went from wilderness, the people living there didn't think it was wilderness, I'm sure, but anyway, uh, to integrate into the US economy uh, in two generations. So can we do the same in space? Can we actually have this lovely space station by <coughs> 20, uh, uh, two generations from now? And I think we can, if we get a commercial uh, space in industry going. Uh, and so 
A space economy, a true space economy, is how we will get space settlements and greater observatories, which, I eventually, which is why I'm original starting point. And as I said, because we will be mining the main belt asteroids, I believe uh, that this is how we will get to Mars to stay, because we'll be going past the, the Mars orbit all the time, making money, and piggybacking on that for human settlement will be relatively cheap. So that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. Um, I may end up being the more practical one of, 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 of the panel. Um, I've spent uh, the better part of 29 years uh, formulating missions both on the non-civilian side and the civilian side. And these missions are um, very exciting, they're compelling, they're competitive. Um, they are, um, they, they require risk, uh, they require uh, with their complexity some very sophisticated enabling technology. Many of them take many, many decades to be uh, realized. But they also have to be executable. They have to be able to be implemented within a cost and a schedule and within the capabilities that we have at any given time as we move down the road. So by um, this problem, as in any one that I would deal with, it, was, it would be with that logic that I would approach um, uh, the problem. And so when I think of human settlements, I start off thinking with um, the extension of life here on Earth, on other planetary bodies. Uh, I, I think of exploration. I think of living and working in space and the ability to do that. And I also think of gaining the knowledge that we need to keep our Mother Earth as our <coughs> core uh, home. And when I think of asteroids, which is a topic that's near and dear uh, to uh, APL and, and um, my, my personal heart, because uh, asteroids are extremely interesting. They're key um, in their understanding to understanding the origin of life. Uh, they're key in understanding the processes by which um, we, we move um, core elements that are key to our life from one place uh, to another. But they are also uh, planetary bodies that need a lot of respect. Uh, they're constantly moving. Uh, we know very little about them. And that by which is going to be um, the premise by which I, I talk uh, today. And the importance of needing to know certain things before you go and before you take on this very interesting uh, pursuit. So I call it know before you go the importance of strategic knowledge. So a couple themes. Um, we've already talked a little bit about history and history as a guide. And if I think what great explorers of the past have done um, before they moved off to creating settlements and, and colonies, uh, there was a, a, a huge amount of exploration. And even when they embarked on those journeys, they took a lot of knowledge with them that had already been given to them by uh, those of the past. So if I look at Columbus, and I look what they had learned uh, from studying uh, celestial navigation and understanding the seas and the tides. And even back in that early time, we moved forward with a bed of knowledge before we took that next step, before we sent our explorers, and then before we moved to the point of settlements and, and colonies. And each of those had different time frames uh, uh, for doing it. Uh, and space is an extraordinary one in terms of time frame because it is so challenging, it is so expensive, um, as we know. And so when I look at science and opportunity and risk and, and moving forward to settlements, I, I, it's such a big problem. I view um, the possibility of us ever being successful as being critical to <coughs> all the players working together well in, um, on this problem. So I'm very supportive of humans and robotic communities working together, private and civilian working together, non-civilian and civilian working together. And I really believe that we're not gonna move forward in any uh, rapid way without having those parties bring their contributions and what they have to the table. We're going to talk a lot about strategic knowledge, what we know, what we don't know uh, with respect to this problem and what I believe you do need to, to know before you go. Um, we'll talk about some of the progress. 
And we'll also talk about the reality of the budget times that we li live in um, and what do you do especially and how especially important it is to work together um, when we have limited resources and also the long-term business case and how do we understand that. Uh, because the, the, the pursuit of mining, for example, is a business situation. And if I look at the mining industry and the decades it takes to uh, get there, how can you correlate that uh, to what we need to do uh, in space? And I do have a second presentation, which I, won't, I, I will give to you, but I won't go over, uh, that actually uh, my colleague uh, gave last week at the Global Exploration Roadmap, which we hosted at the lab, on asteroids and mining and, and the knowledge that's needed to go uh, in that pursuit. So I'll take us back to the Augustine report when we got into this notion of the flexible path back in 2009 and we sort of jumped uh, in. And I particularly want to point out that this last statement is that it, you know, it doesn't say go to the moon but don't go to asteroids, go to asteroids but don't go to the moon, and it doesn't pit one um, community against the other. It says that we should be doing both as we move towards our pursuit of landing on the surface of Mars. And that all of these uh, particular regimes um, of exploration are applicable to our end uh, pursuit. And I think we often forget that. We forget that as we go from one administration to the other based on policy. Mm -hmm. But those of us in the field from a scientific and engineering and programmatic basis, uh, we try very hard not to forget that because we know administrations will change. And we try to keep our, our uh, pursuits moving towards that end go regardless of how those things around us do change. So human to Neo, uh, why? Um, it, it, of course, there are so many things that, that humans could do uh, in, in your space. Um, it is a very challenging problem. Uh, it's not as challenging as Mars. We can get there much more quickly. Uh, it still has some similar problems like radiation, how to survive in deep space over long periods of, of time. Um, asteroids also, um, as been mentioned, have a key planetary defense perspective. Uh, when we look at the moon and other bodies and here on Earth, and if I take Chelevance from last year as an example, uh, there are other very good reasons for studying them and understanding them. Uh, whether it's 100 years or 1,000 years, uh, this issue will still um, be particularly relevant uh, to mankind. So I think you can make some very good arguments as to why you would go to a near-Earth object and why you would send humans to a near-Earth object. But it's not humans and not robotics. It's something that we have to work at uh, together. So there's an overlap and an intersection of, of many, many areas when it comes to uh, near-Earth objects, science, resource utilization, planetary defense, human, operation, human operations. And in this intersection are things that regardless of which area you're pursuing that you must know, you must understand um, as you go down this exploration uh, path. Now this is very difficult for you to see, but I would encourage you to Google it and it was a uh, uh, infographic that was done by National Geographic back in 2000 and time, 2009. And it illustrates how many times we've passed by a body or been to a place and how much knowledge that we've accumulated over time. So if I look at the moon, if I look at Mars, you can see there's a, an extraordinary amount of knowledge, and yet we still have so much more to know. But when I look at asteroids, very, very little has been done. Um, very, very missions have, few missions have been uh, executed. It gives you a contrast of where we are in terms of our state of strategic knowledge. Oops. I'm stuck. There we go. So this is a bit about our state of knowledge uh, for Earth's moons and Mars and how long ago we started that exploration, how many years have gone by, how many countries have been involved in that exploration. We've had orbiters, we've done sample return, landers, impactors. <coughs> Mars is right behind the moon. Um, and we consider to f continue 
from a scientific perspective to view the moon as a very interesting place and a place that we will learn from. I actually view the moon as boot camp uh, where it is a place that you could go from a human perspective and really learn to live and work off planet before you venture to other destination is an extremely harsh uh, environment. Now let's, in contrast, look at asteroids, how little we learn. Um, we've only started 20 years ago. Most um, of our observations have been ground-based observations. We've had very few um, missions. We've only had one U.S. mission. Uh, there's been a Japanese mission uh, to uh, NEAR, which uh, APL uh, was the implementing organization for um, NASA on, well, was back in 2001. Um, we, we have Hayabusa 1 that was done by the Japanese. We have uh, Hayabusa 2, which will be coming up also by the Japanese. And then NASA will have OSIRIS-REx, um, which will be going to an asteroid named Bennu. Uh, which is a very interesting place. It's a sample return mission for a very, very small amount of sample. It's on order of a billion dollars, uh, and it's got a, um, a touch and go, about a four second um, um, way of collecting that sample, and it's a billion dollars. Why is it a billion dollars? Because it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you're, you're dealing with a non-cooperative target that you know very little about, and of course it has a recon mission um, with remote sensing that's very detailed before it actually ever goes in and do the uh, sampling, but it's a very difficult problem, and we have, we know very little ab about it, although these are very interesting uh, topics. So as the administration has gone down the path of going to NEOs, which we find very compelling, we also acknowledge this, that we know very little and we have much homework to do. And there's been numerous knowledge forums, I'll call them. Um, we've had a forum of Target NEO 1 back in 2011, Target NEO um, 2 back in um, 2013, which actually documents in great detail what our, our state of knowledge is um, when it comes to near-Earth objects. And I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. All the materials are uh, on the web from all the presentations, all the final reports. Um, we've also had NASA's uh, SBAG, which is Small Bodies Assessment Group, um, who has also done a lot of assessment in there. And they, too, have a website that has all the information. But fundamentally, you will find that we have a gap. We have a major strategic gap between what we know and what we should know when it comes um, uh, to, ne to NEOs. Now, a lot of work's been done to really specify that. Uh, SBAG took on that task for NASA, and they created what they call these strategic knowledge gaps, and they're done in these categories. All this is on the web. First and forefront is what we need to do to actually identify targets. Um, thousands of targets have been identified, but these are very large targets. This has been done uh, by the ground-based observation program largely, although Spitzer and Neowise and other systems have also found targets. But these have been done with the capability with a, a, a boundary of 140 meter size. Nothing uh, close to what we're talking about doing um, for um, the new missions that are on the uh, manifest, which are looking for, for things that are, you know, seven um, meters up to 30 meters, those, those regimes. And that regime is where we have the least amount of our, our knowledge. We also, and once we identify these, we've got to be able to characterize these targets. We need to understand um, what their surface is and how we interact. If I look at the two that we've been to, Eros and Itakawa, Itakaba as a rubble pile, there's no way we knew or would have known until we actually went there. And those surfaces were very different. And so there's so many different types of asteroids. I actually have all the types, all that information in my other package that, that we really need to explore to understand their diversity because we know that they are extremely diverse. We need to understand the environment of working around them. One example would be how cohesive actually are these bodies? When we get upon these bodies, when we try to grab it, when we try to drill into it, all these things that we want to do, what will happen to it? Will it fall apart? Um, we know that um, most of the regimes are quite full of contamination, meaning a lot of dust 
and uh, matter going around, how will that affect crews, how will, how will that affect our spacecraft systems, and then also what is the resource potential, which um, could be a, a real game changer in terms of mining and commercial applications of, of space. So this is just one um, snippet of what's actually documented as the strategic knowledge, and the top one is target identification, and you'll see the number one thing that remains to be done is having an infrared uh, survey or surveys so that we'd have full sky coverage, uh, which is what we would all hope for uh, in the business so that we can really identify all the t potential targets that are out there. So what do you need for su successful um, exploration in terms of this state of knowledge? Um, here, my main, oops, what I wanted to, to leave you with is that in addition to identification and surveying, all successful exploration to date has had precursors, other missions that went out to really develop our understanding. Um, if I look at the Apollo system, every launch that went up robotically had both scientific and, and technology and um, demonstration goals. And they did that in tandem as they went all the way through the program to get them to a place where they could actually do a very successful uh, mission. And so when it comes to NEOs, there are many precursors that we should do to understand the diversity of these objects and really understand what it is that we're, we're getting into and to better improve our success over time. Um, we had laid this out um, about if you had a decade, which would be equivalent to what we did in, in, in Apollo, what m might you need to do and how would that transpire? And you can see that the first thing on our list was the survey, selecting a target, having a couple precursors before you moved in actually to the human uh, systems. And that's what most in the um, community of implementors would lead you towards for a resilient and a robust and a cost-effective and cost-constrained uh, program. Again, these were the primary um, recommendations out of uh, the, the knowledge forums that we've had. And particularly important also is coordinating with other space agencies and our international uh, partners because it's such a large job we can't really and we do it alone and we recognize we don't have the resources to do it alone. Um, the Sentinel is the one commercial effort that's out there that is trying to take this on, and it's uh, very notable and noble of them in that pursuit. Um, the launch re remains TBD because, unfortunately, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's tough to do this with philanthropy. And um, it's one of the reasons that the recommendation had, had, had been for the government um, to actually um, hop in and help with this and treat it as an asset because it was such an important job. Uh, but we certainly admire organizations like B612 that are, are trying to go in that uh, direction. And of course, in the field, we would be thrilled to have one space-based survey, but we would actually love to be in a position to have full sky uh, coverage. Uh, so right now, the Sentinel is still working on gathering their funding uh, and, and move into an official pre-phase A. And on order, a project like this is, uh, once the study phase is over, you're looking at a 36 to 42 month development period that gives you a sense of how many years before you actually get on orbit uh, to begin collecting uh, data. There, of course, is the Global Exploration uh, Roadmap. We had a big workshop about that last week with our international partners. And getting on the same page with your international partners in their, in their pursuits. So for example, JAXA, um, the Japanese Space Agency, has both programs for asteroids and the moon. If I go to ESA, um, they're pre predominantly focused on the moon and not on uh, uh, asteroids. But again, it's getting us all together. Um, and, and when you so when you work with your partners like this, you don't want to do the just asteroids, no moon, or just the moon, no asteroids. You need to be moving forward as a community because both of them are relevant to us moving forward um, as an international community. So some parting uh, thoughts. Um, 
insofar as if we want to move um, successfully towards our aspirations, we do all need to work together. We need to work together at all levels, both robotic and human, both public and private, to take on such a huge goal, which I do believe someday uh, we'll be able to do uh, to get there to have human settlements uh, in space. But as a community, when you have such a, um, a, a high goal and tall poles to get you there, we need to agree on what we need to know before we go and what is enough before we go to minimize our risk and maximize our return <coughs> on investment. And this, to date, is still not resolved. I would assert, having been on the pointy end of the spear for execution, that we need to be guided by sound scientific, technical, and management practice as we both formulate and execute our plans. And that will call us to bring to bear creative partnerships and continuous communication. And if we do this all together, I do believe we'll further new industries and ventures, get to settlements, we'll advance our policy, our profits, our exploration and technology, and that's the discoveries that serve mankind well. Thank you. And like I said, this other is here, and you're free to look at it on the, uh, on the internet. It'll be with my package. Rosanna? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, the le some of the legal issues. And I apologize in advance. This is much longer than 20 minutes, so I'm going to have to fly through some of the slides. But they will be available. Um, my goal is for the lawyers not to um, throw a wet blanket over this endeavor, but to um, assist, as we do with all of our commercial clients, in trying to make the deals happen and trying to make us get there and commercialize space. However, this is not Texas in 1880. There are laws already in existence, and there are treaties already in existence. So. Uh, the cowboys don't like to think there are, but there are. So just a little bit of background before I zip into some of the fun stuff is, what is international law? Well, there are treaties, conventions, <laughs> multilateral documents. Uh, there's also fundamental principles of international custom and practice, even though if there isn't actually something in writing, if a bunch of countries agree to do things in a certain way and carry it out that way, then you can point to that and say this is custom and practice among international parties. And then, of course, there's legislation enacted by countries. Uh-oh. Um, space property, we've talked about the moon. We've talked about asteroids. Um, it can be actual real estate, so to speak, but it can also be structures built on the moon, like Bigelow. Uh, hopes to do. Uh, property rights are determined by leases and licenses, occupancy permits. There are actual objects launched into space. Um, orbital slots, spectrum rights, intellectual property, and objects that we build in space. All of these things are considered to be, quote, space property. Um, in addition, we have the um, the UN group, uh, the Committee on uh, Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and they have um, various groups that are working on regulatory frameworks for space activities, and of course, they are the ones who came up with the treaties. And speaking of the treaties, this is why it is not Texas in 1880. You have I would say four treaties that are real, and then you have this Moon Treaty that virtually no one has signed. The US hasn't signed it, Russia hasn't signed it, China hasn't signed it. However, interestingly, India has signed it and Kazakhstan has signed it. It's, it's not really based on the kinds of property ownership principles that are um, exist in the US and in England. It's built on sort of common property of mankind principles, which a number of countries have. But we haven't signed it, and we didn't sign it because of the uh, strictures that were placed on mining relative to um, space objects like the moon and asteroids. That was one of the reasons we didn't sign it. Um, the Outer Space Treaty is the one that was adopted by all of the major countries, and we're going to go over that. 
The rescue and return agreement basically says we help out if astronauts or objects are in trouble. We try to get them back to the people that they belong to. Uh, the liability convention in 1972 is a whole liability structure that deals with what happens if things crash into each other or are lost, who pays for what. And the 75 registration convention basically requires if you're going to launch a satellite or an object into space, then you have to be part of a registry. I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about the Outer Space Treaty because I think this is the most important one that there is. Um, you're not supposed to appropriate anything that is a space, uh, a celestial body. That includes the moon, that includes an asteroid, and some would argue that includes uh, the resources from those, and that's of course the big, the big thing that we're discussing. Um, national appropriation cannot be accomplished through any other means, meaning that private corporations and people cannot appropriate the real estate, notwithstanding what you've read or the people that you've seen that try to do that. Um, it has to be exploration in accordance with international law. Um, it has to be for peaceful purposes. There are actually sections of the um, articles in the Outer Space Treaty that say it can't be for military purposes. Um, and it should be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries. Um, on the other hand, the exploration and use shall be free of restraint and discrimination. In other words, countries and anyone that the countries control, like corporations, uh, are free to go up there and explore and uh, use these bodies. Um, and they're supposed to be free access to all parts of space for all nations. Um, Article 9 and Article 4 are big ones. The use of equipment or facilities necessary for peaceful exploration of the moon and other celestial bodies shall not be prohibited. Um, and so you look at Bigelow and shall be on a non-interference basis. So on the one hand, you're not supposed to um, interfere with somebody else. But on the other hand, all countries are entitled to access. So that has to be worked out. Um, states, meaning countries, have responsibility for activities in outer space and on the moon and other celestial bodies, even if they're carried out by non-governmental entities. So if a corporation is on the moon and does something that's problematic, the United States is going, if it's a U.S. corporation, the United States is going to have liability and responsibility relative to that company. Some people like to say, well, the Outer Space Treaty doesn't really deal with private companies. It's, it's, it's not true. It may not say private companies because it was 1967 and nobody thought private companies would ever get to the moon, but it is very clear that each country has the responsibility to supervise and control and deal with any of its citizens or companies that are going to be on celestial bodies. Um, And states and citizens don't lose their sovereignty once they place them into space or on a celestial body. And the country exercises jurisdiction and control over its registered space objects and its personnel. This is an interesting one, Article 12. All stations, installations, equipment, etc., on the moon and other celestial bodies are open to representatives of states that are parties to the treaty on the basis of reciprocity if reasonable notice of a visit is given. So what does that mean for a mining corporation who spends a lot of money to go to an asteroid and mine? I would argue that this Outer Space Treaty actually contemplates that. There is a provision in the Outer Space Treaty, however, that there isn't any governing body or legal institution or the Hague or anything like that where you go and that's where you bring your problems. It, it contemplates the Outer Space Treaty. It's a little amorphous that either the international community or the states involved will work it out. So I view that as meaning if you've got your company and you're mining on an asteroid um, and Russia or China wants to do the same thing, that you would 
the United States and the parties involved would sit down and work something out. Now you say, oh, that's crazy, you know, these people don't talk to each other. Not true, look at, look at the International Space Station. There you have a number of countries and you have um, NASA and you have ESA and when people, when countries wanted to get this done and you wanted to have corporations sending experiments to the space station, you were able to do it by written agreement. There are also international principles and declarations where if, if countries really wanted to deal with things, they could. And you've got, you know, the nuclear power issue dealt with, you've got remote sensing dealt with, you've got uh, artificial earth satellites dealt with. When things reach a certain point, countries will, if not formally by a treaty, at least informally by um, some type of an agreement like the International Space Station, be able to work through the issues and I believe that will be done relative to asteroids and the moon. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the ITU, the International Telecommunic Telecommunications Union, because that's, that's uh, you know, a topic in and of itself, but it just, it administers these orbital slots and frequencies for all satellite communication. There hasn't really been a problem. Um, they deal with limiting the number of satellites. They deal with conflicts between countries in terms of longitude and latitude. It's addressed through an allocation. Uh, the countries at the Earth's equator have a declaration where they assert their legal claim to control the use of space above their territory. All of this is worked out, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work out with asteroids and the moon and Mars. Um, and in no case does the satellite owner actually own the orbital slot. It's a first come, first serve uh, situation. There's a lot of economic value. There is an international organization that deals with uh, disputes, but there's no permanent ownership or use. So a segment of space has been allocated, bought, and sold as a commodity, and companies finance, build, launch, and operate satellites uh, without any real property ownership. So it can be done. You've got the Antarctic Treaty. Again, this is something more akin to what we're talking about for exploration and uh, management and operations. Uh, there were plans for tourism. There's a dispute resolution process. However, big one, it fails to deal with mining and minerals. Um, Australia has the largest claim. There are some questions about their ability to preserve its sovereignty claim. As you know, China and Russia are increasing the efforts. There are international inspections. Um, you might be familiar with the law of the sea. That provides a very interesting um, uh, mechanism, if you will, for dealing with the moon. However, the United States has never uh, signed on to that treaty. Um, it allows for licensing and mining and uh, a specialized tribunal. But it, the resources are declared to be the common heritage of mankind, and many people think that that is one of the reasons the United States has not signed on, because we're more interested in mining uh, operations and uh, securing those resources. So what did we do? And this is what I think maybe we should do with respect to uh, asteroids and the moon. We enacted a statute, and what we said was, while we aren't signing on to the treaty, this statute doesn't um, conflict with the treaty. And we have a, a U.S. Deep Seabed Hard Mineral Resources Act, which is supposedly a temporary measure. It's a statute. Um, and it deals with, uh, they, we just declare that its use is in line with international law, somewhat like Bigelow is, is doing with regard to his inflatable uh, that he wants to, inflatables that he wants to put on the moon. Uh, here you have to apply for a license to the U.S. They require environmental protection, accident prevention, and so forth. And it's a transition to an international mining regime. So the point is, as a country, we have been able to enact a statute which we have determined does not conflict with the Uniform Law of the Sea, even though we have not signed on to that treaty. We have the ISS, as I mentioned earlier, that's basically uh, an agreement, it's not a statute, it's not a treaty, 
uh, but we've managed to work out who owns what and uh, who has jurisdiction over what. We've even dealt with intellectual property rights on the ISS. Um, and we have uh, the World Trade Organization or the International Court of Justice to deal with disputes. So interim solutions, the, um, the law of the sea establishes these economic zones, which the US has actually bought into that. And you could create this economic zone between the coast and 200 miles away from the coast. And each country has the exclusive right to explore, exploit, conserve, manage, etc these natural resources. And the country can construct artificial islands, installations, structures, and you can't interfere with sea lanes. Um, and other countries are allowed to, again, have some degree of access, but they cannot um, take the resources unless it's an emergency. So the, we have countries that are allowed to grant licenses to other nations to fish or use resources or impose taxes. So my interim solution, at least for the moon, was to create something similar called leases in space. Now that would require some kind of a statute. I don't see any reason why, and I know this is hard to do, but it's a lot easier than doing a treaty. Congress could not enact um, a statute similar to the hard mineral resources bed statute where uh, it could be applied to asteroids and celestial bodies. It would allow applicants to build structures, occupy an orbit, claim a safety zone around the structure. Uh, it's similar to the ISS or safety zones around drilling platforms on the continental shelf. Just want to see what my time is here. Okay. Uh, we would retain jurisdiction over a lease and create regulations and permitting procedures so we could say we are um, complying with the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which requires us to um, take control over our own um, citizens and our own corporations and to supervise them. And we could have some kind of an international organization that deals with things similar to the ISS but it, it's not totally necessary. But I think as the previous speaker said, this, this is a big endeavor, and I don't think it's a situation where we're not gonna be working with our international partners and trying to at least put together some kind of a document like the one for the ISS. Now NASA, I was kind of shocked uh, a couple of years ago, came out one day, uh, not the lawyers, and they said, oh, you know what, because of the Google um, contest, the lunar lander contest, we, we're a little worried here because we have these, um, these historical assets on the moon. And so um, we are saying we don't want them disturbed, we, we want an approach path, we want a descent landing boundary, we want an artifact boundary, we want a keep out zone. And then they quoted a bunch of laws that were totally bizarre and um, this never really went anywhere. However, a year ago, which was really interesting, there was a bill that was put into Congress to establish the Apollo lunar sites as a national historical park. And I'm thinking, how are we going to do that because, you know, of the Outer Space Treaty? Um, but what they did was they said the landing sites and the artifacts are designated a national park and um, any area of the moon where these astronauts or instruments connected to the Apollo program are, that's going to be the national park. And uh, they cited the national park system law in support of that and they wanted to ensure proper management of the sites and so forth, but then they wanted to submit it to the UN uh, as a designation of a World Heritage Site. That bill went nowhere. I don't know if it's been reintroduced, but I, I thought it was really interesting, and they don't even mention the Outer Space Treaty. No US agency has official authority over these issues, which makes it a real problem. The state, and, and I think, uh, Michael talked about this in the Bigelow presentation. The, the State Department has primary jurisdiction over international issues. The Defense Department, obviously, on military space issues. 
Uh, NASA has jurisdiction over civil space, and the FAA has this, uh, the Office of uh, Commercial Space Transportation has general responsibility to make sure that all launches and payloads comply with international obligations, which would include the Outer Space Treaty. So it protects the public while promoting the launch industry. Uh-oh. Um, and what Bigelow has done is they've asked the AAA for a payload review request in connection with the launch of the vehicle that's going to carry the inflatables uh, to the moon for the habitat technology and so forth. And what they say is, um, under the launch license, there's not supposed to be interference. And this interference thing is a thing we've seen in a number of these statutes and treaties and in the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, they're supposed to, the FAA, supervise private sector U.S. entities. Uh, and so this authorization and supervision would allow conformity with the Outer Space Treaty and international law and safety concerns. So it's a very uh, interesting way, creative way, to try to get what, or further the conversation. Um, however, uh, the FAA really only has jurisdiction over launch and reentry. They don't even have jurisdiction over on-orbit activities. So I'm not sure how we get them to have jurisdiction over inflatables that are going to be on the moon. Um, and I know that Bigelow is talking to State Department and, and other departments, uh, but I'm not sure how, how the interagency um, situation is going, except they're supposed to have some kind of decision this summer, so we'll see. So what are the possible future regimes? You could have an international governing body, but that would take a really long time. Um, you could have this body issuing license and permits for activities. I think it would be better just to have a statute like we have with the Deep Mineral Seabed Statute. And from that, we, our own government, could issue licenses and permits that would, you know, you couldn't get a license or permit uh, similar to um, prospecting many years ago unless you were actually going to actively work on that area. I mean, in other words, you can't get a license or a permit and then say, I'm not doing anything for 100 years. Um, and it would address construction and mining operations. Um, and there would be some kind of a space tribunal to resolve accident liability and legal claims. So that's, those are my ideas. Thank you. Well, thank you all for those uh, very intriguing presentations. Uh, before I open the floor to questions from the audience, uh, I'd like to ask the first, if I may, and that, and that draws off of uh, a theme that I think comes out of Dr. Reed's presentation, but is very consistent with uh, some, some things that Dr. Elvis said, which is that we need to know more about where we want to go before we actually go there to close that strategic knowledge gap, in other words. Uh, uh, to more profitably do whatever it is that we want to do there. Now, Dr. Reed, you laid out uh, a notional set of missions or activities to, to do that. I'd like to hear you explore on that or expand on that just a little bit more, and then maybe Dr. Elvis, you join in on that, uh, to, provide, to help provide some additional context in terms of what one would want to recommend to the, the folks in the next room that they ought to be funding in order to execute on some of those things what timetables, budgets, capabilities, things that we'd want to look for. Are these working? They're for the camera, so just talk, they'll pick it up. Uh, thank you for the honorary, I'm not a doctor, it's just, oh, just for the record, but thank you. Um, the big one, of course, is the NEO survey, and uh, the NEO survey mission uh, is one that we believe could be done for the costs of a discovery mission, which is, or less than a discovery mission, probably something in, on order of 375 to 450 million, something in that realm. Um, that would be on orbit for numerous years to be able to find our targets. Uh, as I said, we would like to have more than one. Um, ideally, uh, Additional ones could come from commercial, like B612, or they could come from international, 
uh, and that we would all agree as to what the orbits would would be and um, those data collects go into the NASA NEO program which uh, does all the cataloging uh, and identify those targets to, to strict parameters and also that um, cataloging goes into whether or not the object is considered hazardous or not and all that ties a lot back into things like the copious peaceful uses of outer space and how we do that uh, internationally. Uh, from there, um, once we identified some key targets, uh, the precursors that we want to do um, would be predominantly for characterization. So there'd be extensive remote sensing uh, campaigns. Uh, we'd also want to do um, things that would do either in situ composition measurements or actually bring a sample back. Unfortunately, it takes much long longer time to bring a sample back, but you can get a lot with in situ with surface packages that you would deploy um, uh, as well. And then I would say the other precursors on our, on our departure, if you will, uh, that we might have, because um, I think you need more than one. You know, the survey in terms of being actually at the body um, may require numerous missions of the same price tag that we're talking about with Discovery to go to multiple targets. Because for when it comes to human missions in particular, um, human missions are not as good for lots of good reasons for launching on time. And that's fine if you're going to space station. But it's not fine if you're going to other parts of the solar system. So you really need a robust target set. You also need to be able to um, abort and, and, and come back. So we would um, say that you'd need multiple um, surveys of targets for that characterization. And then also uh, explore the planetary defense aspects, which get also into how humans would be able to deal with a body. For example, what's the bulk density? What's the porosity? What's going to happen when I actually, you know, want to anchor to the body or if I want to collect a sample, if I want to open up a bag and, you know, what has happened to that, that uh, a sample? Um, you know, is, is it still cohesive or, or is it uh, not? And understanding that. So, you know, Essentially, before you go down the billion dollar plus trail, which usually will end up to many billions of dollars, there are some very inexpensive, in our world, discovery is considered inexpensive, you know, less than a half a billion dollars that would be worth its weight in gold to mitigating the risk. It could be done very rapidly before you jump to that next step. So, I hope that helps. Yep, there's several uh, parallel paths I think we need to follow. So um, we just heard one, uh, which is the uh, in-space segment. Uh, the survey is very good, the infrared survey. Uh, it can get down to sizes of about 50 meters, roughly. Um, not much smaller, so because uh, they'll just be too faint. They'll tell you the sizes of the asteroids very accurately, which is very hard to do, not in the infrared. They will also tell you the orbit, so long as your mission carries on long enough, it'll give you the orbit accurately enough to go find them again, because getting an accurate orbit can be quite tricky. Uh, in between that and uh, actually sending out fleets of small spacecraft to uh, characterize individual objects, there are various ground-based things we can do, because the infrared on its own doesn't give you the composition. You could also have an inf in infrared spectrometer in orbit, which would be very useful. It could tell you the water content. Uh, but some of the other features are more easily done, are very cheaply done from the ground, uh, from optical telescopes. Uh, NASA is emphasizing radar and uh, infrared spectroscopy. These are, uh, also tell you a great deal of unique information, but they're hard to apply to very large populations, because radar can only reach out a certain distance, and only those few bodies that come between uh, that limit and the Earth can be uh, imaged with radar. But what it does tell you, it can baseline your other measurements that you can do in bulk more cheaply, like the optical ones. Um, when you get to sending out uh, prospecting missions to uh, asteroids, you can put in some numbers. If you have a 10% chance of an asteroid being the one you're looking for, then you need at, at a, to get a 99% chance of the target actually being like that. Um, then you need to send out about four dozen 
probes, and that immediately puts in the math, you have to send out something just about the size that Deep Space Industries, Firefly, or the um, um, ARCID 300s of uh, planetary resources are. They've got the right expense and size, mass, etc., cetera, and, uh, to go there. The instrumentation they put on it uh, is a bit problematic from a prospecting point of view. It's not enough to take a photograph. It tells you a lot, but it doesn't tell you uh, what's under the surface. Uh, spectroscopy of the surface only tells you about rather boring silicate uh, informa uh, silicates, uh, which is interesting for space science, for origin of the solar system, etc., processing, but doesn't tell you about resources. You need to get subsurface. Even a micron or two would help. X-ray spectroscopy is good for that. We have a small instrument to test this out, sort of to test this out on OSIRIS-REx, called REXIS. Uh, but we can do much better, and we're working on that technology. But if you want to get several centimeters down below the uh, layer that gets heated and cooled uh, by rotation, uh, you need to dig down somehow. And if you, you want to avoid landing on the surface, so I tend to like the idea of laser ablation, you fire a laser in, in a few minutes you can dig uh, several centimeters down and you look at the plume of vapor that comes off with spectroscopy, it, uh, that has a lot more information in it than just the surface spectrum. So a lot of de de technological development there of instrumentation and small spacecraft. Um, in parallel with all that prospecting work from the ground, from the uh, space telescopes and from the uh, in situ probes, you need to have a lot of activities in low Earth orbit or in cislunar space anyway uh, to learn how to work with one of these asteroids. That's one of the reasons I'm kind of keen on the asteroid retrieval mission. If you look at the history of human interactions with uncooperative bodies that you alluded to, uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty unfortunate uh, set of uh, uh, circumstances. I think there are four or five of them and three or four of those were very well, barely successful. They, Plan A didn't work, plan B didn't work, you had to go to improvised uh, situations, and that's not what you want to do in space. So when you, and that was a, something you knew what its mass was, you know what its structure was. Uh, doing that with a, an asteroid is going to be much harder, so we need to practice that, not off somewhere at an asteroid, but in a place where you can get home quickly in case of emergency. So there's a lot of parallel activities, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Jeff Fowles, so build, building on that, I wanted to ask the question about NASA's asteroid redirect mission. How, what, what do you see as the utility of that in terms of reducing these strategic knowledge gaps, furthering the goals of accessing the resources? Is that the best way to actually to do that to, for the billion or two dollars they estimate that's going to cost? Or are there alternatives to the arm that you think would be a better approach? You might be able to do, if, I just came back from a workshop about that at the Keck Institute for Space Studies in Caltech. Uh, and it was quite clear there's an awful lot of things you can do with this retrieved asteroid that would further human exploration of space, uh, learning how to go to, to interact with such a body, uh, just from a human point of view, would help with, say, a Phobos mission as a precursor to a Mars lander mission. Uh, having a human, putting a, a lab there to do more detailed analysis uh, of what's in the asteroid would help you practice having a habitat at a large distance. Uh, but also help you understand what the asteroid is made of and practice even some extraction techniques. Because we people say, oh, we know how to do that, but you don't really until you've tried it, right? And you do not try that for the first time half an AU away. You do it where you can, where preferably you can have a person look at it and see that the you know, stone got stuck in the wrong place and winkle it out. And uh, People are very effective at that kind of, uh, of work. So I think it's an excellent place to, uh, to practice mining techniques and techniques for just interacting with asteroids. Rosanna, if we were to engage in a set of missions along the lines of what they've described, but for whose expressed intent was the commercial exploitation of these bodies, either through a national program, meaning since the government wants to appropriate or ex exploit the resources, or it's a set of these a commercial firms are akin to the commercial firms that are there. What's likely the international reaction to that and what responses may they take under the rubric of the regime that you uh, laid out to us? Well, I think because there's so much legwork that has to be done, no matter who does it, in terms of studying, figuring out how to mine it, figuring out what's underneath, et cetera, that's just been expressed, I think that there would be um, 
I think the international reaction, depending on how it was phrased, would be good because um, I, I believe that, you know, the Soviet Union and, and the other, at least the other partners on the space station would have a great interest in that. And um, I, I really do believe that the ISS um, intergovernmental agreement and the MOUs that surround that, the, the hub and spoke activities of that, uh, provide a precedent for being able to do this relatively quickly. I mean, if we, if we, I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't engage the international partners and try to come up with a way to um, at least say that in the future, if we actually get to the mining of these things, we'll, we'll be looking forward to working with them because I'm assuming they want to mine them too. Okay, so that would, we would have to be willing to work with them in the initial set of conditions for that reaction. But what I'm not so sure about the initial set of conditions because I think from what's being said is we're, we're going to have to actually do research and explore and we're not, it's not like we're going to go up there and take a shovel, put it in the ground and bring back <coughs> thousands of pounds of platinum. I mean, the first thing that's got to happen is we've got to figure out which asteroids, where, how to do it, how to get things back, how to mine it. And I think all of those kinds of things are things that other countries would be interested in. And since we do have responsibility for the corporations and individuals that are going to be doing it, um, we're, we're going to have to take some control and supervision of that. Not necessarily in intellectual property, we don't do that on the space station. But we do have a process in place for people to do experiments on the space station. Okay. Sir? Joe Rauscher with the Space Development Foundation. I was uh, glad to hear Dr. Elvis mention the cislunar idea, either with or without a hyphen. There is uh, any benefit to having way stations at any of the Lagrange points or, you know, between the Earth and the Moon and your uh, thesis. And then an another question, I was surprised no one mentioned space tourism mm -hmm. and how it could either help or complicate any of your concepts. Thank you. Okay, um, certainly. Uh, there was talk of, at the Asteroid Redirect workshop. Of, it was basically, what do we do once we've demonstrated we can move one asteroid to a place? Can we use it, or can we use the technology to do move other asteroids, do other things? Um, one idea was uh, to move uh, other asteroids to convenient locations at resonances in the Earth-Mars uh, system and uh, maybe to have supply depots there or, or uh, um, places, refuges there that you could use as, a, as an abort scenario, for abort scenarios. So that's a bit of a long-term thing, but yes. Uh, there was even uh, a statement that it wouldn't be that much more difficult. You would need to develop the solar electric propulsion, another factor of two or four, and we'd be able to, f there are asteroids that are in interestingly close orbits to cycler orbits between Earth and Mars and with a modestly developed solar electric power beyond what's proposed, which is already a development, for the asteroid retrieval mission, you could go and move asteroids into cycler orbits, and then you would have a, you, the idea, of course, as many of you know, is to dig into them and have a radiation-protected environment for the trip to Mars, which has always been a problem, right? So I'm just, I was very surprised how reasonably short term, that is, reasonably close, if you have the solar electric propulsion at the uh, sort of, uh, well, they're doing 40 kilowatts for the asteroid retrieval mission, and if it got up to 250 or something like that, I think they were saying, I would have to check the actual number, but it was within that sort of range, then, then you could do it. I think what's wonderful about cislunar um, is that you can go to many places in near space as well as the moon. And so it gives the flexibility um, for the future for us to, to be flexible. It also is an area for which I think we can tie into our international partners. And it also will give uh, human space a, um, a deep space environment so that we can tackle these very large problems that we have 
uh, that we're faced with, like radiation, which like is, is like the, the number one. So it is the next logical uh, place um, to stage, uh, to go to many uh, destinations and increase both our knowledge and our uh, capability without prejudice to going to one destination or another. Space tourism, um, from a science uh, perspective, we, you know, we have uh, many hurdles yet to, to cross uh, before we could ever, I think, think to uh, get to mining as well as then move the next step where we actually take uh, a tourist to, to space. Maybe have some, Regina has some thoughts on that that's pretty far. Well, I think the asteroid, you know, I, I don't know enough about the science, but but, um, you know, we have had space tourists go to the International Space Station. Now the United States has not been interested in that, interestingly enough. It's the Russians who have the commercial aptitude. And for $20 million on an insurance policy, uh, they have taken, as you know, people to the space station. So I think it's not, I mean, I think it will come, but I think just like with any exploration, first you have the people who explore, uh, and then you have um, the people who settle, and then you have the people who just want to see what it looks like and then come home. Maybe. 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 Well, that Mars sure. One, you know, that company, Mars One, they are, they're working on, um, yeah. you know, bringing people to Mars one way. Mm -hmm. And they have many, many applicants, um, as astronauts and um, military people and science people who who are, seem to be interested in going one way. Aaron Osterley with Polyspace. Um, Dr. Elvis, you, uh, uh, you, you offered a broad, a, a, and I would argue a beautiful vision actually in terms of. Oh, thank you. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a, at least my, 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 from my perspective, there's a disconnect between mm -hmm. the vision you offer and to a certain degree, the points that Ms. Reed raises in terms of, okay, we've got to do the X, Y, and Z, which I'm not, I don't dispute at all. We absolutely do need to do. How do we, how do we set up the structures to get the right operational knowledge to be able to do that? You know, how do we set it up so that we can have two million people on, on, on 30 different asteroids in 50 years? I'm, I will acknowledge those are probably overly optimistic. It's a little much. But, you know, to shoot for that kind of a thing. We spent, I mean, we spent a significant amount of time learning a set of operations with space shuttle, but I don't, and, and certainly the knowledge base from that was valuable, but it hasn't translated into something that allows us to do large scale operations in space. How do we, how do we set up the systems when we go to asteroids, when we go to the moon, when we, you know, whatever, whatever the particular end, end state, how do we set those up so that we get the right operational sets? You first? You know, there, I believe you can be visionary and I'll say practical mm -hmm. at the same time. Unfortunately, the practical is not very jazzy. Uh, we could have done um, the three precursors I discussed. I assert we could have done them by now in the time that we spent arguing about whether or not we should do them. We're spending a very small uh, amount of money. And I, I think what we need to do is get together and stop this um, premise of opposition between vision, not you, but in, you know, there's this argument that, oh, if you're being practical, you're not, you're not being a visionary. And I think that if you put the visionaries and the practitioners together and um, before we got to the policy, part of it, and we could work at roadmaps and, and very logical uh, steps, but then it would require our policy uh, folks to be supportive of that which appears to not be jazzy at times um, and have a very methodical um, approach and supportive over many years. You know, this business that we have to fight for our budget every single year is very detrimental to us being able to really move out on the long-term aspirations that we're talking about. Uh, so I think we need to think about, is there another way, you know, a multi-year budgets and all that, and that we could work and, and make it happen? I think we could. There's the will. Uh, I would say, uh, well, two things. One, in, in the vision side, 
uh, I would say we made enormous progress when we had a goal, a clear goal, which was the Apollo program, right? And that was, I think, having the goal enabled a clear practical implementation. And we've gone, however, for 30 or 40 years without having a really compelling goal in space. And that's why I, need, I feel we need to propose a new one that NASA's it's got a, a cluster of uh, responsibilities assigned to it by Congress, and I think this is muddying its, uh, its ability to get anything done. But, if, but we need to set this new goal so that it's not self-destructive, de like the Apollo program, that it just you've completed, game over, end of program. It has to be open-ended, and it should, uh, it should foster national goals. Uh, in a practical way, not just prestige. You know, the Chinese famously had their treasure fleets going out, and that was kind of like NASA. We showed off. They they went to all the known world and brought back a few giraffes and things, and it was very exciting. It worked because it in intimidated uh, everybody around them, but it, they gave up after a few missions uh, because uh, it didn't really have any practical result. We have to find something that's a practical result, which basically means helps the economy. And I think exploiting space resources is what is just such a vision. And if we adopt that vision as the primary goal of NASA, it will energize the rest of the system to get things done. So that's the vision side. On a practical side, I've been talking to people at JPL uh, about whether the modestly reduced costs that we we're anticipating with uh, reusable Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy, uh, even without reuse, uh, the cost to orbit they claim will uh, come down to something like $2,000 a kilogram instead of 20,000, uh, sorry. Yes, I think that's right, instead of 20,000. Of order, factor five or 10 anyway. Um, what could that do to the way we design missions? One of the problems when we design missions is every time we design a spacecraft, we have to start from scratch because every spacecraft has to have the absolute minimum mass because otherwise you're throwing away tens of thousands of dollars every, every kilogram, right? What if they, we could use some of that mass uh, to make more robust systems, to have over-engineered uh, standard buses that you can make m multiple copies of? It's been talked about for a long time. It's never been quite practical because the launch costs were just too high to throw away mass. We may be about to enter a regime where we can do that. I'm hoping that will bring down not just the launch cost, which is only, after all, uh, for a science mission, like 25% of the total, uh, certainly for our orbiting observatories, uh, but bring down the spacecraft cost itself and even some of the payload cost. So we may be able to, there was a study by Boeing uh, in 1990 that suggested that for a 50% um, increase in mass, you could bring down the cost of the spacecraft by about a factor three. And I don't know the assumptions they made because they don't give the details. And that required a, a fairly modest reduction in launch cost to orbit to achieve that. So I think the prospect is there uh, in a fairly short term of making missions cheaper. So I, that's the more practical side that I would uh, hope to study. Yeah, thanks. Hi, um, uh, panel. Uh, Tad Daly is my name. I'm with a uh, small think tank called the Center for War Peace Studies. We work on uh, reforming and uh, perhaps someday reinventing the United Nations, which will, uh, if, if anything like that ever happens, Ms. Sattler, that will have a lot of implications for the regime <coughs> that you described. Um, but that's not what I want to ask about. What I would like to um, put out on the table is, is actually a nice jumping off point from this last conversation about vision and about setting new and indeed exciting goals. Um, just about a decade ago, I, I spent a whole afternoon with Elon Musk. Um, he was very rich then, but he wasn't quite as famous then, so it was a little bit easier to, uh, <laughs> to get some time with him. And I, um, you know, I said, so you made a zillion dollars with PayPal. Why did you decide to do this with your fortune as opposed to a whole lot of other things? And he said right away, he said, immortality. And at first I thought he meant, you know, he's a big ego guy, you know, I mean, most people of that kind of stature are, but I thought he meant his personal mortality. But no, and, and we had a conversation, and it, the thesis is by no means original to either Daly or Musk, but it was about this two-part proposition that I'm sure many people in this room are familiar with, that one, life on Earth is fragile, the human race is fragile, it is far from inconceivable that in the decades or centuries to come, we will go extinct. You know, I work on nuclear disarmament, among other things, and that's certainly one scenario 
by which we could bring about our own extinction by our own hands, but there are, are certainly others. And then there's external events like a big old asteroid impact for which we are overdue. But there's an insurance policy, isn't there? And that is permanent human settlements off planet. If we can, I'll throw out a figure, a thousand years. If we can a thousand years from now, it may be just a few centuries, it may be 10,000 years. But if we, at some point in the coming centuries, can establish permanent, self-sustaining human settlements throughout the solar system, and then maybe beyond that, even, even beyond our solar system, that's immortality. In that situation I just described, it's almost inconceivable to imagine the human race going extinct. And to me at least, and, and, I, and to Musk as well, and I think to others, that is a big exciting idea and I would like to hear space proponents talk some mm -hmm. about that vision. I'd like, to, I never ever hear anything. Yeah, yeah, the question is is, is, is that part of the vision that we can use to generate enthusiasm about this? Among other things, for NASA, I never once, I've never remotely heard NASA <laughs> talk about that kind of big dream. And I propose that if they do, it might generate some public enthusiasm for the kind of endeavors you're talking about. Okay, thank you. Any comments? Well, I think one of the reasons you don't hear them talking <clears throat> about it, if I, if I go back to the Constellation days um, and all the plans for Constellation and, you know, Village on the Moon and all, that what happens is when you go down that path, then you start going down the path of how much it's going to cost, and that, um, and you take take it all on at one time. That can um, end up being fatal to your endeavors uh, at hand. But I think we do think that way. I think we do think about extension of the species. I think that's why we do solar exploration. We do it to learn not only where we came from and how we can make our life better here on Earth, but we also do it in mind of someday, you know, if we have to, ex ex you know, extend um, life somewhere else for whatever reason, that there's a place to do it. And we do think about that. And then, and, and that translates back today into two areas. What do we need to know to make that happen? which is, of course, feeds into what we don't know, which is so very much, as well as what is the technological capability that we need. And, the te and those two are intimately connected. Um, so we are thinking about it. I just don't know that we're thinking about it or articulating it in as bold fashion as you might be happy with or might be in the, in the open literature. And one of the reasons that we don't is you know, because of budget, I think, and those kinds of things. It's too big of a step um, for those of us working with the agency to, to grasp on. And as soon as we do, you know, we do think back to Constellation as a very recent example of when you get too big and you're thinking too fast, bad things, you know, can happen to your program. I, think, I think a lot of us do think that way, but I just think it has to be at least as a lawyer, worked into the conversation very carefully. Um, I was recently interviewed by Lawyers Weekly, which is the statewide um, newspaper for lawyers in Massachusetts. We did the um, 501c3 work pro bono for the Mars Society. And um, I got interviewed about that. And I did the very last part of the interview, I talked about that. But I think, you know, people when you talk about climate change, when you talk about pollution, when you talk about all the problems facing the earth, I think people can get more on board, and I, when I say people, I mean the average person can get more on board with, yeah, we really need to expand out, as opposed to we really need to seed the universe with, with humans, um, you know, as an insurance policy. I think, I think people are willing to go the step of yeah, maybe we really do need to get to the moon and do some things there, so just in case, or maybe even Mars, maybe we need to terraform it or we need to, you know, find a way to live there. But the idea that we're going to seed the entire universe with the human race, I, I think it's too much for people. Um, a lot of people that I speak with in Massachusetts, which is not, you know, California or Texas or Washington, um, they, they equate space with the NASA space program. Um, and Apollo and the Space Shuttle and ISS. And, um, and they're not even sure why we really need that. Uh, can I 
Yes, sir. I would say the great trick about having a commercial uh, space program, space economy, is that you don't care what people think anymore. It will just grow on its own. And you don't have to ask a bank for money from the, from the government. It will make money itself. It will be even a source of revenue. And it will grow and grow and grow. And that is how we will get to Mars in a long-term sense. We may have a human expedition first, but in the long term, settling there, the only economic way to do it is by having a space economy that is making money. And with that, I will close this, uh, this session. I want to thank you all for joining us today for, and being part of this conversation. If you would please join me in thanking the panelists for their great presentations.